Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for our latest episode of Ohio DD Talks. I'm so excited for today's episode. Since it's the last episode of 2022, I've decided to spotlight some of my favorite moments that happened over the past year on the podcast. I'm known for asking really thoughtful questions, and we've had some excellent guests living with disabilities. And my hope is that in spotlighting these moments is that you all really can learn from their shared experiences and think about how they can help you live your best lives. I hope you enjoy listening to these clips as much as I enjoyed revisiting them for the episode. Thank you so much, and we'll get started. Renee, honestly, you're one of the strongest voices for people living with disabilities throughout the state of Ohio and, yeah, dare I say, nationally. You have a powerful voice, and I know that um, you're a great deal, you know, you're older than I am. There's, there's no secret about that, and I think the way, you know, you, you uh, <laughs> experience self-determination, you know, you know is uh, incredibly different than the way I have, and I know that, yeah, a, a big part of your success was identifying your needs. And I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about what you've done at your individual level to help resolve your own personal direct care crisis, and then also how you identified your needs and advocated to address them. You know, I think that um, people who this very have the responsibility of of learning what they need. And the reason why that helps the direct referral crisis is because when someone new comes into your home, yeah, they can read your ISP. Yes. They can read your care plan, but they have no idea what that really means in real life. So when you, if you can do that, I mean, you can say, I mean, imagine this, a stranger, you might have met, you might have met them once or twice in an interview, but Basically, it's a stranger coming into your home to help you. They walk in your house. They see you laying in bed. And like, okay, what do I do? You know, that's what they're thinking in their head. Like, I want to do this, but I don't even know where to begin. And that's where our responsibility comes in, that we got to know our own needs. We got we to gotta be able to tell them in detail how to get us out of bed, how to get us on the commode. And you may think, oh, they should know that. But like I said earlier, every individual is different. Every individual does it a different way. And I, I noticed that when I can tell somebody how to do something, they are so much more comfortable with, with working in my home. Because they don't feel so, so lost. Um, another, another thing is that um, we also should be recruiting our own people. We should also be going out there, even if they don't work for us. We should also be telling people 
the people would display new assistance and get them interested in becoming GSP, even if it isn't for us. I, I think that for a lot of us, it, you know, if people with disabilities aren't exercising their right to vote potentially they're going to have leaders that maybe may not represent their best interests and so that's another really important reason why voting is important so moving on a little bit what do we need to actually cast the vote in terms of the registration process and actually voting um when we vote either in person or early or via absentee yeah so most one of the most important things this is essential to being able to cast the ballot you have to be registered to vote um so the registration deadline is tuesday october 11th um, if you want to vote on tuesday november 8th for that election you have to be registered by october 11th so that's that's essential that you be registered to vote um when you're voting in person, so there are a lot of different ways to vote, which we'll talk about um, in a few minutes, one of which is to vote in person on election day, Tuesday, November 8th. Another is to vote early in person at um, the early voting location in your county. It's usually either the Board of Elections office or another location that the Board of Elections will designate. And then you can vote basically at home, um, through an absentee ballot, that's the third major way to vote. Um, if you're voting in person, either early voting or at your polling location on election day, very important that you remember to bring identification with you. So usually that's going to be your driver's license or a state identification card, something that shows your name and your address. It can actually be your former address if you have a driver's license or state identification card. So it doesn't have to have your current address as long as you're at the right polling location. So if you moved, but your, your driver's license or state identification card hasn't been updated, that's okay. You just need to make sure you go to your new polling place. Um, you can also bring with you as a form of identification, like a bank statement, a paycheck, um, a utility bill, a military ID. So those are some other ways that you can show identification at your polling place on election day or at the early voting location. Last point I want to make on this question is we typically recommend people have a plan for how they're going to vote. Um, so you may decide, I want to vote early. I don't want to, I don't want to wait until election day to vote. Either I'm going to request an absentee ballot or I'm going to go to the early voting location. We just recommend that people have a plan in place because you never know what's going to happen on election day if you're sick or um, unable to get transportation that day and you're scrambling to try to figure out how to get to your polling location. I've heard of that happening before. So it's, it's always good to have a plan A, a plan B, a, a plan C um, for how you're going to vote because you want to make sure your vote is counted. So yeah, and, and one last point I'll make on this. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, you can always contact Disability Rights Ohio, our intake department. We can answer any questions that you have or if you need advocacy on any types of these issues or just have questions you're unfamiliar with the process or you haven't voted before and you need support or you need information or questions answered, please reach out to us. So can you talk a little bit more about just the role parent advocacy plays in, in helping to develop the IP, but then also to strengthen the advocacy and uh, self-determination for children with disabilities? Mm -hmm. um, right. So yes, this time of year is always a, a, a busy year. And, and I can say that, you know, I don't miss uh, those <laughs> IEP meetings at all. I don't all. either. Um, and so it's been, you know, obviously some time um, since uh, we haven't had to do that. But um, I would say that 
um, to, to other parents out there that um, you really need to sometimes step out of your comfort zone um, and, and educate yourself, really know what your child, your student's um, needs are, their challenges, their successes, um, because unfortunately, and with my experience, the school personnel, and we're talking about special education services, um, don't always know. Um, their job is to, uh, you know, look like they know, but they don't always really know. And so as a parent, it's really important to understand um, what your child's needs are. Come to the table with suggestions. It, and it takes a lot of time and research. Um, but that's what I had to do, particularly when Justin was um, in elementary school, is, is seek out um, appropriate accommodations in terms of software and, and, and other things like that, and really advocate for those, um, those things um, at the table. One other thing um, that I think that, it, at least in our experience and in speaking at the time with other parents, that's important is that it, it feels like Oftentimes, um, the IEP team, which is supposed to include um, the parents, but um, I think we all know that team, meaning all of the related special education services, they've all been working on this IEP, um, and oftentimes without your input, and then they present it to you. And um, as a parent, you should be getting that IEP, draft IEP, well in advance of the meeting, not sent home in the student's backpack the night before a meeting, and then you're supposed to be able to, you know, um, provide that. And, and that's, you know, kind of a simple thing to really um, advocate for, you know, and, and it's okay, in my opinion, to say, I didn't get this IEP draft um, in enough time for me to read it, digest it, um, and be able to come to the table and talk about it. So, um, you know, we need to reschedule this meeting. I think those kinds of things are really appropriate and important. Yeah, I definitely understand the importance of advocating for yourself when it comes to accommodations. And it definitely seems like you, know, you and Justin sort of took the bull by the horns in terms of asking for you know, the things that you needed. Can you talk a little bit more about specific accommodations and services that you and Justin requested and how you supported him to have more assertiveness of his rights and, and to essentially make sure his voice was heard as he got older and prepared to transition out of high school? Right. You want me to, can I, can I step in on this? Sure. You totally can. <laughs> it is your podcast. Yeah. So... Um, a couple of things in, in response to that. First of all, I think that sometimes I don't want to, I don't want to discourage anybody from advocating for themselves. It's, like, it's obviously a very important thing to do, but I think I worry sometimes that when we have these conversations about advocacy, we're, we're ignoring kind of the root problem. I don't think that the root problem is that there's disabled students who just aren't sticking up for themselves enough. I think most disabled students who are able to end up advocating for and knowing and being aware of what they need in the context of their education. I think the problem is that there's a lot of people who are trained to ignore those repeated requests, those repeated demands. So like, it, yes, learning to advocate for oneself is important. And it would, I'm really fortunate that I had parents, you know, plural, who were willing to carve out that space for me as I got older. Um, because I think, you know, the, the original consideration is, you know, if you have a kid that's in second grade, you want them to enjoy being in, in second grade. There's this idea that like, especially if IEP meetings get particularly contentious or, um, you know, create a lot of drama you want you want the kid to be able to enjoy being the kid so there's there's some tendency i think um 
among parents, understandably, to kind of keep a screen up. But I think as really as situations become more difficult, as year after year, you're asking for, like in my case, um, scanning math homework was a huge thing. So I can't, I can't hold um, a pencil to handwrite. And this was back in the era before every student had a laptop provided by the district. That's pretty standard depending on what district you're in now. But back then it was kind of relatively unheard of for somebody to do all of their work electronically. Um, but when I think of just how much time it took to, it was, I would say eighth grade before I had a math situation and a math software that I was fully comfortable with. At first they were sticking me with a scribe. Um, then later on we found sort of a math pad software that allowed me to put numbers into a grid, but then wasn't as good at manipulating shapes and doing geometry and that kind of stuff. So it was probably about eighth grade or so before I really felt like my IP team was all on the same page and all on the side of me just doing something as basic as um, completing math homework. And yes, part of that is, you know, me learning to become a stronger advocate, but part of that is also just the makeup of the IEP team changing, having teachers and support staff that are actually willing to frankly do their jobs, right? Make it so that I can access the content. Well, everyone, that's the end of our show. I want to thank you all for listening and sharing your stories with us this year. I want to encourage you all to re keep reaching out to us because we use your suggestions to play in future episodes of our show. And I'm looking forward to new and exciting things in 2023. My goal for this podcast has always been to center the voices of people living with disabilities so that we all can come together and learn from shared experiences to live our best lives. We have a few surprises up our sleeves for 2023, and we can't wait to see you in the new year. Happy holidays and see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.